your brain starts be getting ready for something terrible to happen. And you start spending your energy on trying to control yourself before that energy, that explosive emergency part of your brain blows up and you become a defensive person. You spend a lot of time trying to keep control of yourself. And yet the moment that, that primitive part of your brain, which basically has no cognition, has nothing thinking there as an automatic animal type response, the moment it feels like, oh my God, it's happening again. You start acting as if you're getting hurt, as if you're getting assaulted, etc., etc. And when that happens, um, you react excessively or you shut yourself down. And not only does it do terrible things to you, but the world about you starts shutting you. Welcome to this How To Academy event in collaboration with Mind Health 360, which is the home of integrative mental health and functional medicine psychiatry. We believe that you can only heal mental illness by treating all the factors that impact your mental health, from the psycho spiritual to the biochemical to the lifestyle behavioral. One such factor which affects all those areas is traumatic stress. And tonight we're in for a treat as Dr. Bessel van der Kolk and Benjamin Fry discuss trauma, its impact on mental health, and how we can heal from its detrimental effects. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk is one of the world's leading experts on traumatic stress. He's the founder and chair of the Trauma Research Foundation, was a professor of psychiatry at Boston University Medical School, and is the author of several books and hundreds of scientific papers. His best-selling book, Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Treatment of Trauma, has been over 111 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and has revolutionized our understanding of trauma, its neurobiological effects, and its treatment. Benjamin Fry is the founder of Neural Solution, Chiron Clinics, and Get Stable. He's an accredited psychotherapist, author, and entrepreneur whose first book led to him presenting a popular TV series for the BBC. His most recent book, The Invisible Line, helps us to understand the detrimental effects of a dysregulated nervous system on our mental health and how to fix it. So Bessel and Benjamin, thank you both so much for being here for the How To Academy and Mind Health 360. We really appreciate it. And you'll speak for about 45 minutes and then take questions from the floor. So ladies and gentlemen, enjoy what promises to be a very exciting, informative, and helpful conversation on one of the most pernicious and prevalent causes of mental health issues worldwide, which is traumatic stress. So enjoy. Thank you so much, Kirkland. That, that's a very generous introduction. And uh, I would say that your work at mindhealth360.com is well worth a visit. And your, uh, your podcast and your interviews, the Mind Health 360 show, I would commend to, to all of our audience. Um, so Bessel, I first heard your name when I was in treatment myself uh, in Arizona in, a, in a, a trauma unit, I guess you would call it now. Uh, and this was 11 years ago. Um, subsequently, I've got to know you and your work uh, with much, in much more detail partly because I uh, foolishly set up my own clinic in the UK to copy the one in America, which has been a very exciting adventure, which you've helped with. Um, one of the things that I had to do in that adventure was to receive people who uh, wanted, wanted to explore help and to understand this new paradigm. They would come with a basket of prior mental health diagnosis and they'd want to understand what was really going on. And, I had to find ways to very quickly tell them a new story in you know, an hour and a half or two hour consultation. One of the stories that I came up with was this story about, so there's this guy running down the road. He's like wildly looking around, barefoot, screaming. And I asked them, you know, what do you think of this guy? And they'd say, well, he seems crazy. I said, would you help him or avoid him? They said, well, I'd avoid him. And then I say, so coming around the corner, you see a fully grown adult lion chasing him. Now, what do you think? And they say, well, he, you know, he, seems, he seems normal now. And I said, if you could help him, would you help him? They say, yes, you know, obviously I'd help him. And what's instructive for me in that is that the man in the story is identical. So there's no difference. Uh, it's just that the difference between us saying that they've got a mental health problem and not is an understanding of the context. And of course, that's uh, you know, what I called my book, The Invisible Lion. And people, 
some people connect with that idea. And there is this sense that people can understand that we're all to a greater or lesser degree running away from some invisible lion where the context has been lost. So my first question to you is really about that. It's about what is the mechanism for that? You know, how exactly is it that the body keeps the score? Well, um, we have a brain that helps us, our bodies to survive. And so basically we learn how to get along and we learn how to manage our lives and we learn to eat at the right moment and we get to collaborate with other people. And uh, this development of the brain gets, uh, can be really thrown off when uh, something happens and you're at a complete loss about what to do about it. And what causes you to be in a complete loss is usually a state of terror uh, of like, oh my God. And, and your whole system collapses. And um, if you raise babies, you see it happen all the time. Little kids have terrible events all the time. You see kids being extreme distress. And if you're a cool parent, you pick up the kid and you rock them and you sing songs to them and you feed them uh, before too long the kid is calm again. And so the natural uh, way in which people learn to regulate themselves is through each other. But if there's nobody there for you, and particularly if the source of your extreme distress is the very pe person who is supposed to be there for you, um, then it really starts affecting the growth and development of not only your brain, but also you, your personhood. And you start you, at the center of the brain, in the limbic system, um, as a neuroscientist, know that they, it, nobody talks about it as much anymore. But there's a, a neuroscientist at NYU called Rodolfo Linus, who really mapped this out and said, in the middle of our brain is a map of the brain. And uh, the map of the brain is, the brain is a predictive organ. And that if I sit in the TV show and I suddenly start doing weird stuff, that sooner or later somebody's going to cut off the camera. Or if I start yelling at Benjamin, sooner or later Benjamin is going to yell back at me. Uh, and so I know that certain actions have certain consequences on the basis of what I've learned. And if you learn somewhere along the line that something may suddenly happen to you and you'll, uh, you'll get raped, you'll get destroyed, you get made to feel completely helpless, your brain starts be getting ready for something terrible to happen. And you start spending your energy on trying to control yourself before that energy, that explosive emergency part of your brain blows up and you become a defensive person. You spend a lot of time trying to keep control of yourself. And yet the moment that, that primitive part of your brain, which basically has no cognition, has nothing thinking there as an automatic animal type response, the moment it feels like, oh my God, this is happening again. You start acting as if you're getting hurt, as if you're getting assaulted, et cetera, et cetera. And when that happens, um, you react excessively or you shut yourself down. And not only does it do terrible things to you in that you start feeling like I cannot control myself. Um, people are doing terrible things to me. I get beleaguered, so you start really getting a very negative idea about yourself, but the world around you starts shunning you uh, because you react in a way that other people don't react. And you become angry, but other people don't become angry, or you shut down and when people are dancing and suddenly you behave like a terrified person. And so your whole social environment starts reacting to you like, uh, Let's not get involved with this person. So it has major effects on your personality and on your friendship patterns and your social patterns. Can and so, can I because, just, yeah, like, can I just break that down yeah. a little bit? Um, because it sounds like what you're saying is that there's there's two discrete problems here. And the first one is that your brain starts to learn to expect a reality that's not necessarily there. Maybe that's the invisible yep. line analogy. And as a result, it, it starts to do things which are highly appropriate if there was. At some point it would have been appropriate, yeah. 
Yep. It's not like we've malfunctioned per se, because that would be a great function to have if the, if the scenario was real. But the, somehow <coughs> the kind of information <coughs> has become corrupted. Um, the expectation has taken over from reality. And so yep. once that process is on board, then a secondary factor begins to occur, which is that how does this then affect our relationships? Because if I look like I'm reacting to something that's not there, a third party can see it's not there. So they right. start to see me as a difficult person to have a, have a relationship with. And then you're saying that's a compounding factor because the degradation of the relationship then reinforces the original problem, which is that we're not really getting on very well with our reality. Is that right? Correct. And that's the outside thing is people start shunning you, but the inside thing is that you start shunning yourself. Mm. And you think about yourself, I'm a defective sh shame. I feel very ashamed of who I am and that I have these reactions that I cannot control. And then you start compensating for it and being excessively nice to everybody to make up for the fact that you have lost control at some point or you start avoiding people or you so go live by yourself and you start drinking because you can no longer trust yourself. Mm. But at the core is that you get stuck somewhere and that the part of your brain that supposed that is in charge of time doesn't know that the threat is over. Yeah. And so the critical issue of overcoming it is to get that sense of time back on the line and go like, oh yeah, okay. I was really brutalized as a kid or I was raped and it was terrible, it was terrible what happened to me. But today I'm talking to Benjamin on Zoom and I, it's okay. Uh, nobody's raping me, nobody's attacking me and I can focus on the present. But when you get traumatized, a large part of your mind is always ready to go like, when will it happen again? And are they going to do it? And can I trust myself? Because my, I cannot trust either my own system or the people around me. Okay, but you're, you're articulating the problem through the language of uh, the, the kind of prefrontal cortex, if you like. You're saying, I'm thinking this, I'm thinking that. And uh, it, is a, it is a problem of, of time, but your book is called The Body Keeps the Score. Yeah. And I think that um, there's more to the story because it's not really just that there's a, a sort of cognitive expectation. You can't yeah. easily defeat it by a cognitive reframing because there's something deeper going on. Isn't exactly. There? Yeah. exactly. So, so, you know, as Westerners, we think that we're rational human beings. Of course, our history completely contradicts that we are rational human beings. When we have been brutalizing each other and doing terrible things to each other since time, time immemorial, but our basic notion about ourselves is still we are rational people and we can work things out. And that we are, when we think that we are in charge of ourselves and can control our behavior. The reality is that about three quarters of our brain uh, is in the back of our brain that we have basically no control over, and that's in charge of your body. We have a brain in order to steer our body and take care of our body. And so at some point, you need to go to the bathroom. And uh, you can say to your primitive brain, don't be stupid, don't waste your time going to the bathroom. But when you need to go to the bathroom, you need to go to the bathroom. And when the primitive brain says, I'm hungry, I need to eat, um, before the long, you have to eat. And if you're you have to sleep, you have to sleep. And so, and you have to breathe. And so basically the whole big part back of your brain is there just like your dog and just like your cockroach is there to steer your ways through the world. And then as humans, we got a little frontal lobe on top of it to explain what we do and to understand what we do. It's a marvelous part of the brain. I wouldn't knock it at all. But the problem is that um, if you, let's say like Benjamin, uh, if you happen to have been molested by somebody who has a Dutch accent, now you talk to me and you feel threatened and angry, triggered by my accent. And you can say to yourself, 
don't get angry with the guy. Don't get freaked out by him because he's a reasonable guy with a funny accent. But you're, the back of your brain is impervious to that rational stuff. And you will have that intense reaction to, let's say, my accent or any number of things. Um, and much of the time, your frontal lobe will not even be able to understand why you freak out so much. Yeah. And that only when you go into therapy, you go dig inside of yourself, oh, the reason why this guy freaks me out is because he just talked like that uncle who molested me who had his accents. But these are automatic reactions that come from that map that we that gets created for us in the back of our brain as we grow up. So would it be fair to say this is what some people refer to as the limbic hijack? Uh, the, you could the call it that, 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 that's not unreasonable. Yeah, it's not only limbic, it goes even deeper than that. Huh? Uh, you go into the brainstem, that arousal reptilian brain. And as you know, when people get really, really uh, traumatized, they become, can, can become extremely uh, freaked out, extremely angry, very out of control. Uh, and then, of course, what happens is that we have these systems where our, our nervous system communicates with each other. And so you have this mirror neural system. And here you're sitting in front of me and you look really nice and peaceful. And uh, so I go, oh, and your nicefulness and your peacefulness uh, really becomes part of me. And the kinder you look and the sweeter your voice is, the calmer I feel and the safer I feel. Uh, but if you start getting, if I start hearing some tension in your voice and little crinkling about your eyes that you get frightened or fearful, I pick that up and I start mirroring your response. Mm -hmm. Before too long, we will be fighting with each other because this, that primitive part of our brain gets activated and our frontal lobe will find out all kinds of excuses why I should hate you. So really, part of the problem here is that we are... In our internal dialogues in our heads, we're, we're usually persuaded that we are just one person. So I think of myself as Benjamin and I chat to myself in my head. But there's a huge amount of activity going on in the posterior part of my brain, which is hardwired into the autonomic nervous system, which goes throughout my entire body. So you've got right. two way pathways. I've got signals coming from the body and going to the body. And that's all yeah. happening on its own um, without the governance if you like, of the executive branch upstairs, right. uh, which inherits whatever goes on at the back of the brain in the body. And then maybe that, that doesn't fit in. And then you're saying that that can actually stimulate itself uh, a, a reaction in the posterior parts of someone else's brain that we're trying to relate to. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. But, but the back of our brain had a survival brain is there to, to help us to survive. And it's very powerful. And so the moment that that back of the brain gets a feeling of like, better get out of here or you're gonna get killed, uh, your frontal lobe can work like crazy to say, don't do it, don't do it. But the, the, there's enormous power to that back of your brain. And so what we also slowly discover is that the engine of all this is in that survival part of your brain and then what we discovered, although people have discovered it over and over again in various cultures, is that if you help the body to feel safe, the mind starts feeling safe also. Mm. And, uh, you know, I had my great lesson about that in South Africa when I hang out with Bishop Tutu for a while. And that country was about to explode and, you know, the, Tutu, Mandela, all those people, they knew like, we're going to be born in a country like India that's going to explode the moment it's all over. And so Tutu and the other guys, but Tutu born and anybody else, took it upon himself to try to help people to feel calm and not live by their trauma. And I saw Tutu at work and it was spectacular. He sang with people. He danced with people. He moved with people. He prayed with people. And just having these people's bodies move together gave you this feeling of safety and containment. There's no, nothing cognitive about it, but there was a sense of synchrony and safety and pleasure 
that came through rhythms and movements. And what to me has been interesting is that when you travel around the world, is that people around the world, have, most people have traditions in response to terrible events. People move, sing, and hold each other. Mm. But that somehow disappeared in Northern Europe, except during a national tragedy, you get together in your cathedrals and you sing, oh God, our help in ages last. And when you sing together, you start feeling calm again. But psychotherapy has never really bought into that. Well, I sometimes think that our biggest problem that we uh, face, the biggest legacy issue, is that for over 100 years, we've called these things mental health problems. And I slightly wonder, as I've explored your work and your colleagues' work, if uh, this is a kind of misnomer, this is something we say because we don't have anything better to say because we didn't yet understand the problem. Because the more and more we talk about this, the more it becomes apparent that the things that we categorize as mental health problems like anxiety or depression, I mean, take for example, the, the guy running from the lion, are rooted in the physiology. They're rooted in the neurobiology, the anatomy. And if we had framed these things from the beginning as a, an imbalance in, if you like, the communication between different parts of the brain. I wonder if we would be so confused at this point, and I wonder if it would have been so difficult for pioneers such as yourself yeah. to bring this work forward. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I'm not critical about it because, you know, humans are incredibly complex. And we can only talk about it as a neurological problem once we know a little bit about the neurology. But people don't, realize is that 30 years ago, trauma was not on the map. When we created the diagnosis of PTSD in 1980, uh, we said, this is an extraordinary event outside the ordinary realm of human experience. That was our definition in 1980. And then we start looking at it and we go like, there's trauma everywhere. And what was astounding is we have been blind to domestic violence. We have been blind to incest. We have blind to, to child abuse. We just didn't see it. Now, here are people who are working with people who are upset and nobody asked about, did anybody beat you up? Did anybody rape you? It did not exist. The textbooks of psychology and psychiatry had no talk about rape, incest, domestic violence. Like, we were so blind, you know? And then, uh, so this field is 40 years old. Okay? Uh, and then somebody finds out that doing cognitive behavioral treatment makes people 10% better. And they say, oh, we have found the treatment of choice and everybody should do CBT. No, that's the first little thing that appears to make a little bit of difference. We are very young and we don't know anything. And maybe a little bit of CBT might be helpful, but it doesn't solve the problem. And then we learn about neurobiology and people say, oh, it's an limbic system. Yeah, but then we learn, 10 years later, we learn something else. And we learn about the, how the vagus nerve works. And then people say, oh, the vagus nerve, everything. Now we have the answer. No, because just above the nerve, vagus nerve, there's all kinds of other brain structures that still make it more complicated. So we use the language that we have access to by the technology that happens to be available at that particular point. And we usually about one, 10 years behind. So we're already using the technology for uh, have used language that already is outdated by the time we formulate it. Well, I mean, you have, th thankfully for many of us, including myself, um, the pioneering work that you've done and your colleagues has led to there being pockets of professionals who do understand uh, this, this formulation and it has increased and are attempting to provide treatments based on um, this, this deeper, more causal formulation of the problem. And you mentioned treatments that might work. What, uh, what are you advocating at the moment? What, what would you recommend to people who are listening today who are resonating with your description of the problem? How, how should we be addressing this? For me, the big window into the new world was EMDR. 
EMDR is a crazy treatment. You ask people to remember stuff, you don't have them talk about it. And then you ask them to move their fingers, eyes from side to side and follow your fingers. Bizarre. And like everybody else, I said, don't do that. That's crazy stuff. And then, you know, I get to see that it works. And we do the first study funded by NIH on how well EMDR works. And it works spectacularly well to deal with trauma. And I go like, wow, that's interesting. Uh, you do this weird thing, eye movements, that doesn't fit with any of the paradigms we have. And you bring about dramatic changes in people. So for me, this was like, oh, so bizarre things may work. And then people say, oh, I benefit from yoga doing for my trauma. And I go like, really putting your butt up in the air and twisting your, your body into a pretzel is helpful for dealing with old stuff. And, you know, being a little weird guy, I, I like to explore these, these weird things. Uh, go to NIMH always six times because you always get rejected the first five times. So it's very labor intensive. And the last time we get a grant and it shows us that yoga has a more profound effect on trauma than any drug that people have ever, ever studied. Huh? And so when you ask me, what do you think is the best treatment? I go, to, no, we're on a journey. We're in a journey of discovery and let's see what works for you. And let's explore what works. And let's not say, I have found the answer. And then uh, a very important thing that I also learned is that we talk usually talk about people as a unitary self. And then Dick Schwartz amplifies something that earlier people like Genet and Jung had, of this, but it's become very popular now because these things have always been said before. Um, and he said, we have multiple parts and in order to protect ourselves from feeling so horrible and helpless we develop defense mechanisms so we become very controlling and uptight and that becomes our character structure in order to keep that terrified frightened part of me under control and then when i can, can't control it any longer i confuse feel completely out of control. And this person who's always uptight and careful suddenly starts drinking or taking cocaine. And we call it a firefighter. When the whole system breaks apart, there's something else jumps in to keep you under control. And you start understanding that people do what they can in order to survive feeling completely disintegrated. And then you get to see that, oh, some people cut themselves in order to stay under control. And I go, that's interesting. For some people, cutting seems to be a helpful way of coping. The long range is probably not so great. Other people find that starving myself gives me more sense of control. And then people say to these people who starve themselves, you, you better eat. If you don't want to die, you have to eat. But they don't understand that this learning to not eat started off as a self-preservative way of surviving whatever they try to survive. And so that you get to see that a lot of weird things that people do are in essence self-protective ways of desperately trying to not succumb to complete helplessness. And so you get to see how complex people's adaptations are and to help people, to respect people for whatever complex adaptations you have, I say, I wish you wouldn't kill people in order to survive. And let's try to do something about it. But this rage that you have, where does it come from? What, where does it, did this rage start? And then when you, and then the critical element, and that is something I feel quite strongly about it. And I'd be surprised that I would change my mind about it before I croak. And that the critical issue is the development of self-compassion for that creature that you inhabit. Mm -hmm. And to really get to understand, like, I develop these habits and these coping mechanisms in an attempt to, to desperately stay in control of myself. 
Yeah, I think that it's one of the one of the most helpful ideas that people I see in treatment take on is when we move from this delusion that we are just one entity. As I was saying before, I have this kind of dialogue with Benjamin, but um, really the model that I sometimes think of is the hung parliament, which we had in Great Britain for a while over this Brexit fiasco. And it's really just, you know, it's a lot of people shouting. <laughs> agree with each other. The and, British Parliament is a great, great yeah. example. Of it. <laughs> and yet they, they need to come to a decision because as you said, the brain's job is to move the body really. They're like now speaking is moving my body. I've got to come to a decision. And the, a lot of the stress that I think people who've been fragmented by traumatic experiences, uh, even traumatic with a small t, just you know the difficulties of life, uh, a, a lack of nourishment in childhood. Yeah, so, I, I don't call these things small t's. Okay. I actually, uh, Francine Shapiro was the person who invented it. I love Francine. Uh, she died two years ago, but. You know, being neglected by your mom and being ignored as a kid is not a minor little thing. You know, every child has the birthright to be adored. And when they see my grandchildren, when they walk in, into a room, everybody goes like, oh my God, isn't she cute? And I think that is what kids need and that's normal. And we are wired for to be adored as kids. But if as a number of people I treated, if you say, oh shit, I tried to abort you as a kid because I knew what a terrible kid you were, that is a trauma and that becomes your identity. That's not a minor little thing, man. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I, you know, I think that one of the difficulties with this field is the word trauma has begun to be bandied about left, right and center. It almost yeah. becomes a bit of marketing tool for a lot of people. Yeah. In this industry and people don't really understand what it means uh you know and to me i don't particularly like those distinctions but i try and help people who want to say well i've never been in a car crash i've never been divorced so i don't have any trauma really i think anyone who's had an unfinished reaction to something anyone who's got an invisible lion around the corner um has experienced what we could define as trauma and peter levine's catchphrase i think was trauma is in the body not in the event which i uh, think that's right. Um, so, you know, we can end up with these fragmented parts, this kind of rowdy, uh, hung parliament. And I, I think it's one of the most important ideas to take on. I sometimes say to people, well, you're familiar with this because you'll say, you'll go to work and you'll sit down with a colleague and you'll say, oh, you know, part of me really wanted to stay in bed this morning. And so we know this, it's part of our language, but we, we kind of think we don't know. It. We think it only applies to people who are massively, I don't know, schizophrenic or borderline personality disorder or, or a dis dissociative identity disorder or something. But it's not. I think it's a part of all of us. And I think you're right yeah. that Schwartz's work and Janina Fisher with, with the similar work has, has shown us in our field how important it is to layer these integrations from working with the brain into the cognitive, into the executive and, and so on. And I suspect that's why your answer to the question, well, you know, what do you do about this? Is, is quite manifold, it's quite complicated. Yeah, you know, it, it comes up all the time. You know, I was recently talking with uh, Eve Ensler, who, the author of the Vagina Monologues and other things, her name is now V. And I love her and I love the work that she does. And she has gone through a long trajectory and at the end says, I've done that treatment, I've done that treatment, I've done that treatment. And then she says, at the end, what was most helpful for me was ayahuasca, ayahuasca. And I go, see, that was your path. Mm. And the next person who I meet, I have another friend, maybe I won't mention her name, although pretty public, uh, the person who taught me neurofeedback, also had a horrendous, uh, traumatic background and for her neurofeedback was the best answer and I know other people who did resolve most stuff with EMDR um, you came to one of my or one of more of my psychodrama um, workshops for me my own psychodrama experience was extremely powerful 
uh, did it change everything? No, it's a very powerful component of my own journey. Uh, uh, and so I think it's true in your journey also, uh, Benjamin, is that we take one piece at a time and we grow. And it's not like, oh my God, I found the answer. Uh, it's not like, we're not a religion. It's not like the moment you <laughs> you find that particular religion that you'll go to heaven. No, you, you take care of pieces of owning yourself, basically. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And one of the things that, you know, a theme in what you're talking about actually is, is kind of innovation. Um, it's one of the things I notice in your book is that there's a lot of references to things like brain scans and EMDR often uses equipment. Neurofeedback is very much a, a, a computer-based piece of equipment. Um, this whole field would be totally different without the equipment to do brain scanning. But there's another side to innovation that's emerging, which I think is fascinating, which is this, uh, this, this research that you're doing into using substances as an mm. therapy. Uh, and I wonder if there's anything you can tell us about where you think the field is going. I mean, we've, we've talked about uh, the last 30 years and particularly the last five or 10 years. What do the next five to 10 years look like? Well, you know, we are creatures of fashion and we go from one new thing after another and we abandon old things. Like, had, um, I studied the history of trauma very carefully and uh, the way the early people treated trauma was through hypnosis. And I've read numerous case histories of people really getting cured with hypnosis. Today, nobody does hypnosis anymore. Huh? Um, so things come and go. And then when I was a college student, I lived in a psychedelic world. And like every good college student who went to school in the 60s, I took LSD and mushrooms, as did every one of my colleagues and friends who have become a major scientist. And, um, and when they asked my friends, what effect do you think this, uh, the psychedelics have had on your, on your, who you are today? Every one of my friends says, you know, the psychedelics were profoundly important for my, who I became, because as a scientist, I needed to see that the universe is much larger than the universe that contains me. And LSD helped me to see that there is lots of things we don't know and it helped me to explore that. And so when Big Dublin and Michael Mithofer started to explore psychedelics, uh, I warned them, I said, you know, people who I know who did this stuff have gone to jail and they uh, never worked. So they say, I said to them, don't do it. And they said, thank you very much for your opinion. And they did it. And they really are showing something that doesn't surprise me a bit that if you psych take psychedelic agents very carefully under very controlled conditions, and I can't say that uh, enough because I run a, run a laboratory that does that right now, um, it needs to be extremely careful. Then when you take these drugs, you, you live in a different mind and you see yourself in a different way and you feel oftentimes calm, particularly if, a, if you have really good therapy around you, and you can explore yourself in ways you have never explored yourself. And, you know, I've, I, I'm the spokesperson for MAPS right now. So uh, I can't, and they told me specifically until the paper gets published, I, I, we don't want you to tell the specific results yet. So I, I won't do that. Um, but it had extremely good results, like extremely good results. And it was also uh, very surprising to me how, uh, in the 12 sites around the US in which the studies were conducted, there was not a single serious adverse side effect. And that I think is quite remarkable because playing around with these substances is not an innocent little thing. I think you know, every time you open up your mind to explore the dark recesses of pain and trauma, you really, um, it's an act of great courage and uh, and it, it is also potentially dangerous. So it needs to be done extremely carefully. But uh, much to my delight, the results are really outstanding. 
That's amazing. And is that the study with MDMA? That's MDMA, right. How about this? Parallel studies going on with psilocybin. Um, as far as I know, nobody, nobody's formally studying ayahuasca, but certainly the anecdotes about ayahuasca are also very positive. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, don't mess around with this. Uh, uh, I, I want to actually say something about it because ketamine is one of these substances also, and ketamine is legal. And so the moment it became legal, people set up these clinics where you can go and you get your ketamine and you go, can go home and you take your ketamine. I think that's a terrible thing. In fact, I have a friend who went with a really hard time and he went to a ketamine clinic to deal with his extreme depression and he went home and he killed himself. Mm -hmm. And so this stuff should be done under very careful protective circumstances. You shouldn't do it by yourself. You really should do it when people are around you to help you with all this stuff that comes up. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense in the Andes, when people do uh, ayahuasca, you don't say, hey, go take that, stu take that stuff. There's a whole ceremony about it. And the ceremony is very important. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's very, clear that the the umbrella around everything that we could put into the pot of trauma understanding treatment uh, and formulation is community but right. there's something vital about understanding the role of community and benign safe relationships in supporting anyone to heal from any traumatic injury through any method whatsoever and the terrible tragedy, of course, is that when people are braced against reality, they don't, they don't gravitate towards community, they don't gravitate towards relationships, they sometimes don't even gravitate towards love. And so it's a, it's a self-defeating problem often. Um, yeah, it's a complex issue because see, we are communal creatures, but in our capitalistic society, we don't think about, oh, let's make sure that Benjamin is well connected with everybody of people around him. Let's see if we can sell him his fancy new car uh, so I can, I can make some money. So our, our culture is very individualistic and medicine is very individualistic. And, uh, and so our treatments are always, oh, you suffer from that disorder and let me fix that disorder in you. But the reality is that we are all deeply interpersonal creatures and as you well know, our brain is an interpersonal brain. Much, many of the functions of our brain are about connecting with each other and making connections with people. But that is not a critical core issue in how we generally uh, deal with treatment. But for example, I'm on a bunch of social media with people who are actively treating COVID right now. I'm really interested in what their experience is like. Uh, when you treat COVID, you're part of a community that treats COVID. You know, you're not alone. Huh? It's just, you're part of a team. And when you treat trauma, you need to be part of a team. It's not like you're messed up and let's forget about everybody else. It's always, these are always things about us as a member of a larger community. Well, it's a little tragic understanding of that for us at the moment when we look at our world and we look at how there appears to be an escalation of traumatic injuries and traumatic behavior and a breakdown in community and trust. And I, you know, I know you're very vocal, particularly sitting as you are in America about wanting to reverse that. And I, you know, I, I think there's so many problems and so many ideas about solutions, but for me, number one is people can begin to start regulating themselves and therefore regulating better with others and therefore building stronger, safer communities, and therefore, so on and so forth, and you hope that there'll be better nations. Um, so look, this is an amazing, amazingly quick tour around uh, the legacy of your incredible life's work. And we have some questions. Um, I hope we can transition now. I can ask you a few questions from our audience. But can I say something? You know, I don't see this as my work. You know, uh, I think about all the people I've worked with, uh, uh, Judy Herman, uh, 
Roger Pittman, uh, Frank Putnam, uh, Robert Pinus, you, uh, Stephen Porges. I, mean, I just can give you name after name and name. We have been a community of seekers. And I, I, you know, I'm just one voice in the middle of this large community, you know? It's very true. I mean, I find personally, I'm not more nourished by this community than any other community I know. Mm. And, you know, it's a profound connection and people are profoundly driven by mission and purpose. And, it, you know, it's a beautiful thing. I'm grateful that you've invited me into your tent. It's been a wonderful experience. Um, so we have a, we have some questions. Let's see how we get on. Uh, here's a good one. What would you advise when trying to learn to love your body after a traumatic experience? Um, it's a very good question. We really like <laughs> fantastic question. It's a real question. Like so, what I think you touch touch is an essential part. You know. You know, it's interesting. I recently read, we read something by Bowlby and Winnicott, and they both talk about touch. And they go, hey, they're British upper class guys who talk about touch. And it's like, <laughs> 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 sort of a contradiction. <laughs> but they both got it. Yeah, that, that touch is an essential part of feeling safe in your body. And of course, in our field, nobody's talked about touch. And no clinic that I know, maybe Kieran House does, has. I think you guys have body workers there, uh, no, but it's very unusual, actually. Um, what's interesting is that we we got got into some money this past year, and what are we, is the time a research foundation spending its money on to to study the neuroscience of touch at the time of COVID when nobody's touching anybody, you know? <laughs> uh, but how do you feel safe in your body the same way that your mom makes you feel safe in your body? by rocking you and holding you and singing you to you and getting that rhythm going. I think that's a very, very fundamental part of feeling safe in your body. And f for God's sake, find, find somebody out there who is a real good body worker. And I was just talking with somebody about it. And what is striking to me is that in our field, the more immobile people become, the more, the more respectable you are. Like, who has respect for body workers? You know, they're, they're low people to totem pole. And what is it about us in our culture that that has that disdains people who touch people and love people who rigidly create formulas that are disembodied? Well, we live in the age of reason, not in the age of embodiment. <laughs> Aren't we reasonable, right? Like, for me, it's interesting that. Um, we have this severely damaged mentally ill president in, in America, and this in these four years, um, the psychology of reasonableness has become ever more powerful, uh, pretending like people are, are reasonable human beings, where all around us we see in insanity on the show, you know, like, like wow. <laughs> Okay, so as you're saying, it's it's important to try to find an uh, an access safe touch. Important yeah. Distinction between just touch in general and touch that feels safe and nourishing to the system, and the system uh, relaxes into it rather than braces against it. Um, another question is: If you've forgotten your trauma, can you look at the physical symptoms to help figure out what happened to you? And well, I would answer that. Uh, is that even is it even necessary to figure well, out? I'm sure you have an answer for that also, Benjamin. But people don't start off remembering their trauma. I don't think anybody has ever come to my office and say, uh, "I'm a 42 year old lawyer and I want to deal with my getting molested by my uncle at age four. No, people come to my office because they say I'm a very successful something or another. But whenever I get close to somebody. I saw a temper tantrum and I freak out and I cannot maintain a relationship. And so it is not the story of the past that drives people crazy. It is the imprint of the past on people's bodies get, that gets relived. And so the question, do you need language for where it comes from? I don't think so. I mean, this is something I've been mulling over for a long time and depending on when you catch me, sometimes they'll say absolutely it's necessary, sometimes they say absolutely not necessary, and the, the final word isn't there. 
But the issue is that your body keeps the score. And so your body will play out the story of your trauma. And is it necessary to find the words, the circumstances? It's probably helpful to know where it started. But is it absolutely necessary? Probably not. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think the distinction is slightly to do with kind of the integration of all these these parts in the in the deranged parliament. Um, but let's uh, acknowledge that some of the things that happen to us happen before we have words. That's right. Actually, there really isn't much to do there with words anyway. And the, the somatic yeah. um, solutions can be very powerful. Yeah, so so uh, you mentioned Janina earlier. Janina was one of my favorite uh, members of my team a long time ago. And I just reviewed her new book. And she put it very, she said, uh, trauma treatment is not about uh, digging up the trauma, it's about repairing the trauma. Uh, and I think that's a very nice way of putting it. And so what can we repair? Mm -hmm. And certainly as long as touch is frightening to you, we might be able to repair. And I couldn't do it. Don't come to me as a massage therapist, right? but go to somebody who can help you to feel really pleasure and comfort in your body. And whether you connect it up with your, the fact that your mom was alcoholic and would beat you up from time to time, it's probably useful, but not necessary. I, yeah, I concur with that. So um, I've got another question here, and it brings up for me one of the reasons why I don't particularly like using the word trauma anymore, because I feel like it, it's this double-edged sword. Yeah. It's a good question. It says, if trauma is a natural reaction, is it an evolutionary benefit to being human? Can it ever be necessary or even helpful? Actually, I don't think it's a useful evolutionary adaptation. Uh, your initial reaction is useful uh, of starting to scream or hiding yourself or disappearing or whatever you do. Uh, but it, you're supposed to come back to normal. I think PTSD is a disease. It is the system breaking down. When you look in the wild, I know Peter, my friend Peter Levine, who I greatly adore, um, talks about in the wild, you don't get PTSD. That's not true. When animals get traumatized, they die. Uh, that the, the getting stuck in the trauma and continuing to behave as if that old stuff is going on right now is not useful. And in the wild, if, if you do that, you, you won't survive. But there's a distinction to be made, I think, between the trauma as being an adaptation in the moment of threat to survive, yeah. which is so I might go into a dissociated state to get through uh, an experience where I'm trapped, I can't fight, I can't flee, and I need to just calm my system down to survive. And then what we're really talking about, PTSD, is a post-traumatic stress disorder. There's nothing really wrong with the mechanism of trauma. It's an evolutionary adaptation that works for us. But if we don't come back, if we don't finish our reaction, we don't unfreeze, if you like, and discharge the energy that was stored up, then I think we are spending the rest of our life running away from this invisible lion. And that's not natural, is it? That's, that, I mean, Peter talks about the gazelle. That's not what the gazelle gazelles shake it off and go back to the watering hole. It's complicated because um, who was the guy, the, the great the inventor of physics, English guy? Um, Newton? Newton. Read the biography of Newton. He was one of the most traumatized human beings who ever lived. Another thing that trauma does to you is it's causes you to try to push that traumatized piece of yourself out and to hide yourself into new territories. And what Newton clearly did is that he hid himself in mathematics and invented mathematics and physics because that was his safe place. Uh, another one of my favorite person is J.K. Rowling. She has a terrible trauma history. And then at age 30 something, she started writing Harry Potter stories, where, which is all stories about trauma and survival. 
And so she uses what she learned from her horrible, whatever happened to her, to create amazing art. Um, I don't know her, and I shouldn't even talk about her, but I don't know if she's a well person. I just know she's a spectacular writer. Uh, mm -hmm. And so here's this curious part of, of mankind is that trauma is part of what happens to all of us and trauma can destroy your life. And at the same time, it can spur people on to astounding creations. And it doesn't mean that when you are able to create astounding, beautiful things to compensate for it, that you are a well person. And so just because you are able to compensate somewhere over here, doesn't mean that you are a self-loving, peaceful human being. You can still be tortured and still be very creative at the same time. But increasingly, you know, I've hang around with quite a few people who, have, who are really very interesting with terrible trauma histories. And I come more and more to the feeling of maybe I should do with my own parents sometime. Thank you for being such shit because I learned so much. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and so there's something about having terrible experiences that also spurs people on to amazing solutions. And so I feel increasingly like, go thank your mom for beating you up all the time because look how much you learned. Like, you know? yeah. Well, yes, and, and it's also true that you can find uh, new relationships and new figures in your life and uh, better connections and more benign. And I think that that's one of the things that's interesting for me. You know, I've, through this work, I've connected with more and more healthy people, I have relationships with people like yourself. And it makes me realize that uh, on, there's, a, there's a downside, which is you realize what you didn't get when you were younger. But the yeah. upside, as you said, is you can also begin to see the gratitude for the journey you've been on and the things that you've had to learn. But that, you know, that gratitude can be very hard won. And for a lot of people, yeah. that's a difficult message to take on board right now. Um, so, we're about we're drawing to a close here, but I want to ask for people who are in the audience who are interested in pursuing maybe ways to find help for themselves. Uh, one of the questions we had is, is exposure the solution to all of this? I'm sure you have thoughts on that. Um, but more generally, I want you to just conclude, if you can, by suggesting how people could take forward finding the help that does work for them and where it might be. Well, that, of course, is the big challenge right now. You know it, and your search was a very painful search. And um, uh, my take on this is still, for everybody who I know, their journey has been a journey of trial and error. You know, at the Trauma Research Foundation, we are trying to create networks of people who are thoughtful and skilled, therapist, but we're not there yet. And part of the reason why I wrote my book is for consumers to read it and say, this really appeals to me and I would not want to do this, to give you a range of options. And then your job is to find somebody who knows how to do that wherever you live. And um, it's very difficult because when you're traumatized, you feel stupid and ignorant. And when you meet somebody who makes you feel bad or is not particularly helpful, it's very hard for you to say, oh, this person is not helpful, let me try somebody else, because you don't trust yourself. That is very much my own experience with my own psychoanalysis, which was a complete waste of time and money for two and a half years. Uh, it took me a long time to get out of it. And I was a professor at Harvard. And uh, it took me two and a half years to say, like, what the hell am I doing here? And so the, issue for you to judge whether something is good for you or not is a major, it's, it's a tough one. And I don't have a quick answer for that. I, I hope you can give a better answer, uh, Benjamin. Well, I tell you what, I can give my email address, benjamin <laughs> at ironclinics.com. And if people have, uh, you know, if people have been stimulated by this and would like some follow-up help, I'm very happy to, to try to help. Because as you said, it's complicated. There's no perfect answer. 
So we're, we're out of time now, Bessel, but I just want to express a uh, huge gratitude on behalf of myself, Kirkland Newman and How, How To Academy and Mind Health 360. It's been wonderful to share this hour with you. I miss sharing <laughs> hours with you at Italian restaurants yeah. in Rome and around the world. I can't wait to sit on a little terrace with you somewhere in the world and drinking a nice glass of wine and catching up with each other. And it would be, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I can't wait. In the meantime, keep yourself well and we look forward to seeing you soon. Okay. Take care. Be good. Bye.